I'm going to take the teachable moment. Uh, Julie just showed you some, some pictures that were out of focus, out of whack, and so forth. Can you figure out why? Remember that first one? It was a picture. I think the person was trying to take a picture of the leaves, but they got a picture of the house. What happened? You don't know? No. Autofocus. All the all your instruments have autofocus. So uh, remember that the 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 programmers for your cell phones, even your uh, little digital cameras and so forth, they actually can program them to look for faces first, structures second. Where is plants in that programming? Isn't there? Okay, so what you have to do, since the house was in the background in that particular shot, you need to move yourself around to where it's only the sky in the back. Now what, and, then, and she had one at the next to the end where that was a problem. The sky was in the back and what did that do to the image? Silhouette. Yeah, it's now just a silhouette and, and most of your digital cameras, if you take a look at it, there'll be a little picture of a person with a bright background behind it. Okay, so you need to set it on that one. Now, th those to me were the, the easy fixes for that. The other one that I find is that we all have cameras in our smartphones and, and similar devices and, and so forth. And here's what happens as an entomologist. People find, and, and here's a big bug, people take their phone, they, they get close to this, maybe eight to 10 inches from that, that's, that's easily within the focus. Most of the, your cameras can actually go down to about four inches from the object. And then what do you do? Once it's in focus, you say, oh, that's pretty good. What do you do? What's the mistake you then make? Zoom. You hit the zoom. Now, what is the zoom for in a camera? Zoom in a camera is for me to be here and to take a picture of somebody way off out in the field. That's what the optics are for. When you use your camera and the macro setting is kicked in and taking that close up picture, when you hit the zoom it throws the macro out, fuzzy picture. Okay, so don't mess with the camera. Let it adjust. I'd rather you be a little bit further away from your close up and be sharp than really close and fuzzy. Uh, and, and I'm pretty good at telling fuzzy insects, uh, but, but uh, th those are just a, a couple of little tricks uh, with those. All right, well with that said, how do I state that? I think it was kind of pointed out before uh, uh, Winston asked me about the pepper plants. Uh, and, and Julie pointed out, Dave, your pause was more informative than your yes uh, on that. And, and here's my deal with this. Folks, when the plant is in the landscape, the landscape is a very complicated system. There's lots of plants in there, you're, you're set, uh, even an individual landscape is set, has to be set in the context of a neighborhood and a whole urban environment. That's a very complex system. When you're trying to grow these plants, you're kind of like a corn grower and a soybean grower, even while you've got a whole bunch of plants, you have blocks of the same species of plants, okay? So it's a, a, a simpler system in that aspect, and, and because it's a simpler system, how can you encourage all these biological controls to come in there? It becomes very difficult, and you do, I, I, again, I have, I've been in this business long enough, I have to smile at my colleagues trying to create a wildlife habitat around your plants. Uh, and you know that's not going to work. What's going to happen? You get a wildlife habitat around your plants. Well, you're stealing nutrition, nutrition from your plants. The, the water can't be managed as easily. You're going to get the deer, the skunks, the raccoons, everything else coming in and wanting to utilize that. My philosophy when it comes to nursery, I, I understand this. I'm all for integrated pest management, but you want to deliver the healthiest plant to your customer and hopefully it is pest free. Now that's the goal. I know it's, it's literally impossible to deliver it pest free, but we can do some things to make sure that when we've harvested that plant, and what happens when we cut that, we, we you know, dig that ball of roots out of the soil? What have we done to that plant? Julie mentioned this, it's very important to us. We've stressed the plant. And I'm actually a proponent, and, and this is where I'm running into to real problems with things like Home Depot 
and Lowe's, because you may have heard Home Depot's and Lowe's is informing some of their suppliers, we don't want plants that have been treated with neonicotinoids. Well, I'm here to tell you, if you want good survival of your oak trees, when you harvest an oak tree, you really ought to pre-treat that with a neonicotinoid. The year that you harvest that, you should drench the base of that with a neonic. Why? You know? You'll keep out the number one killer of that oak tree. You know what the number one killer of that oak tree is in the first two years? Two-line chestnut bore. And I've actually seen trees that I've gone onto the, the garden center lot, and it's always this tree, and it's typically July. The tree arrived in May, so it's been there for uh, nearly two months. And, and what, is, what have they taken care of it? Well, they kind of water it once in a while. When it really droops a lot, then they may water it again. Perfect situation for two-line chestnut boars to find that tree, to lay their eggs on it, for their larvae to get into it, and that customer won't even know that boar is there until next spring. And all of a sudden, you've all seen this, a little strip of the bark suddenly starts to die off. Okay, uh, And what do we often say with that? Oh, that must be sun scald. You know, the, the tree was oriented this way in the nursery and we planted it. Oh, come on, give me a break. Okay, that's not what's going on. The other one that they always say, well, when they, they put it in the truck, they rub the bark on it. You've got to be pretty, you know, not very good nursery producer if you're bruising the plants on transit. Okay, and, and so it's really two-line chestnut bore. And my idea is let's prevent that. I'm telling the, the landscape people to do the same. If they've got a customer that just recently got an oak tree and planted it in the landscape, they need to treat that for at least two years after that's been transplanted to keep that two-line chestnut bore out of there. Once the oak tree has been established and it's on its own again and doing a good job, you can leave it alone. It's no longer susceptible to that. It's got past the stress. Okay, I hope you kind of are getting an idea of my philosophy about management. It's, it may be a little bit different than some of my colleagues. <coughs> First thing that I'd like to, to point out to you, you've got a new booklet in here, a uh, very good booklet that, that's got a lot of the, the insecticides and fungicides and things like that, that that are listed, but really there's only five or six plants in there. Where do you get the rest of them? Well, here's the deal. Uh, I'm in consultation with all of my colleagues, uh, Dan Potter at Kentucky, uh, Greg Hoover uh, over at, at uh, Penn State, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of people and, and all the other areas areas around the surrounding states, we've kind of gotten together, we've decided that why is it that every state is producing this booklet that has all the insecticides in them, uh, when the reality is is that if just one person every couple of years will decide, and it's my turn, uh, so I've, I've got to do the, the new revision of, of our bulletin uh, for uh, Ohio, but it will be basically available for the entire region. What I wanted you to point, uh, notice is that the latest one of these, and again, this is getting it uh, to be a little bit dated right now, uh, but the, the one that, that's got the most up-to-date of the insecticides that are registered for both landscape and nursery usage is this uh, AGRS 025. Again, if you, if you can't remember that, just go to Penn State or put in Google Penn State Bulletin AGRS 025 or if you just say Penn State Woody Ornamental Bulletin, this will pop up. What's the beauty of this is that the first thing that pops up is that they'll be more than glad to send this to you for about 30 bucks. But if you look just below that listing, there's a PDF copy of this. So you can download the PDF and print it out yourself uh, and, or just keep it on file um, and have that. So I just wanted to point out to you, there are some resources out there that do list. Now the beauty of this one is that they also have a plant pathologist at Penn State that works on ornamental plants, Gary Mormon, and he's also listed all the fungicides that are available. <clears throat> All right, from, here's my view of what I see in the nurseries. We have what, we, uh, what I call emerging pests, and emerging are either new pests or pests that we haven't had much trouble with and, and uh, haven't dealt with. And, and to me, some of the emerging ones, obviously quarantine pests. We all have to worry about quarantine pests. If you're harvesting plants, especially if you're shipping them across state lines, usually within state, 
not much of an issue. But if you're transporting plants across state line, you have to be aware of the quarantines, things like gypsy moth, uh, white grubs in, in the balls. And, and here's where I have a problem with this is that we were out in a nursery yesterday and I guarantee that if we dig around the soil at the base of some of those oak trees, what we're going to find are May June beetle larvae. Now what's the quarantine specter going to think? They, they, you dig up one of these, you put it on the truck, it goes into Indiana, the, the inspector looks at it and says, oh, there's a grub in here. Reject. What's wrong with that? It's supposed to be for Japanese beetle, not the native ones. But let's be brutally honest here, these quarantine inspectors don't have the training in many cases, they don't have the time. If it's a grub, they're just going to assume that it's Japanese beetle. And so in many cases, what we have to do in Ohio, where we've got a lot of nursery stock that's being shipped out, we have to be clean of all the grubs, not just the Japanese beetle. Actually, Japanese beetle in Ohio is becoming a, a sort of a, a rare critter uh, anymore. We've got other grubs that have taken their place, but the inspectors don't know the differences uh, between those. Uh, you're also aware that uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid is sort of steadily moving across the state. Uh, we've uh, discovered it in Ohio now. Everybody's all been out of shape about it. Frankly, to me, as a nursery pest, it's very simple to control. And typically, one, as I say, nuking of that will keep it out of your trees for two to three years. Uh, and, and so it's, it's an easily managed one. Also worried about this thousand cankers uh, in, in walnuts, but uh, I mean, how many walnut trees do you actually produce for landscapes? Uh, hope, uh, probably not many, uh, but uh, it's, it's ending up, uh, there are some people that are producing some uh, walnuts for particular situations. Obviously, the, the Asian ambrosia beetles have been a real concern. Uh, and here's the bottom line on the Asian ambrosia beetles. We're, we're still trying to figure out what is a stress plant. Well, this is kind of circular reasoning. Uh, a stressed plant in your nursery is one that's attacked by the ambrosia beetle. <laughs> Get the, you know, it, in other words, it's almost impossible to us to see and detect. And what I'm hoping for that with some of this new technology, we've already heard of technology uh, talking about infrared and trying to figure out whether plants are under stress and so forth. Uh, I think that technology is probably going to have to be invoked in order for us to really effectively manage things like those ambrosia beetles. We're also seeing a lot of leaf miners resurging, uh, and I think the, the reason why we're seeing some of these leaf miners resurging is we've changed our chemistry. We've gone very heavily into the neonicotinoids. That works very well with the sawflies and the beetles, but there are other ones. Uh, we're going to, when we take a look at the, this nursery this afternoon, we're going to find a block of oaks that, that has the solitary oak leaf miner in it. And my feeling is the reason why that solitary oak leaf miner is in there is that the neonicotinoids do not kill caterpillars very well. And since that is a lepidopterous leaf miner, that one's not being hit. So we need to be watching out for those. Why are we using so much oaks now? <laughs> yeah. What's happened? Ash trees. You know, we, we have to find replacements for the different trees that we're losing, uh, losing. And the reality is, is that even though oaks always have this kind of reputation of being slow growing and so forth, that's not what I see. If you get the right species of oak in the right habitat, it can grow just as fast as any of our other deciduous uh, plants out there. And so people are learning that, they're picking these things up, but then what comes with oaks? Bumps and bobbles uh, with them. And, and there, there's all of these things that go on. And here's the issue that you have as a nursery producer Juvenile trees often get these galls more than the mature trees. And so you're left with a, you know, you, you've got a customer that wants to buy the tree and they say, oh my God, look, it's got all these bumps and bobbles and, and goofy things all over it. Yeah, it's a juvenile. It's, it's like zits on their face. That's what they get, okay? Hopefully when they grow up, they won't have these. And, and the only one that I get really worried about, however, is the gouty oak gall. That is one that is detrimental. That is one that can actually cause slowing of growth and some dieback of the plants. But the, the rest of these are really, as, as Julie indicated before, cosmetic. Uh, and, and they're things that, in essence, as the tree matures, should disappear. 
<clears throat> well, how do you discover white grubs? Well, what I find is a lot of people discover white grubs by letting the animal show where they're at. I call them land shrimp. Uh, and obviously skunks and raccoons like to, to eat them and, and uh, where they find them, uh, they're, they're pretty evident out there. The problem that we've got with these is that how am I going to control these in a nursery situation? And, and here's my deal with this. White grubs are not really an issue in the growth of your plants during the growth phase. But if you're in that quarantine area, what I would strongly suggest is you, you probably need to treat those plants in the blocks that you, plant to, uh, you plan to harvest the next year and transport across state lines so that you, you avoid the quarantine. There's a lot of insecticides that, that are out there. The cheapest one right now are generic imidacloprids. Now in the past, when Bayer had this, uh, it was really, really tough for you to get imidacloprid at a decent rate. And I know there were some nursery producers that went out and got uh, fuel crop imidacloprid and applied it in, in their, <clears throat> uh, their strips between there, you know, to manage the strips, <clears throat> wink, 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 uh, and, and, and keep the grubs out of that. But the reality is, is you can now get some generic imidacloprid at around probably $35 to $40 an acre uh, that can be used in, in your nursery stock. And again, when should you apply it? Well, if you take a look at the, these, uh, Applications in May, that's not very good. You're gonna get uh, you know, only 80% reduction. That means 20% of the grubs are gonna be there. That probably means an inspector is gonna find one. And so what you really wanna get is, is in that 90 percentile. What's the best chance for the 90 percentile? As you can see here, if you send her in on the month of July, as being the, the treatment for this. Now think about this. This requires pre-planning. I'm going to treat my plot in July for the trees that I plan to harvest next winter and next spring. So that's what I'm talking about, the pre-planning. You can't wait until next spring to treat them because you're going to be out of the window of good grub control. And so this is one of those things you need to plan ahead in order to accomplish that task. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Uh, my feeling is, is this walnut twig beetle is, is uh, uh, lining the pockets of some researchers. Uh, it's, it's probably important uh, that, that we do some research on this, but I'm beginning after seeing what's going on in, in terms of the uh, uh, monitoring and detection of this, I think this disease and I think this insect has been here for a long time. And it's only when we have trees that are under stress uh, that, that both of these working together can take the trees out. Where this really caused a problem is that this beetle and the disease got into the western states. And there it has devastated all the walnut species and, and completely taken them out. So we're, we're really concerned about that. Uh, the, the states that we're worried about are out in here. This is where it's really taken out, uh, especially the, the uh, European walnut production areas in here. They're really worried about losing those. Uh, as you can see here, we're, we've detected this in here where there's blanks. That usually means that we really haven't looked that closely. And I find it kind of interesting. Why would we find it here and here, but not in between? Uh, it usually means that, that we need to, to be looking closer. Julie, have, have you actually, have you detected this yet in, in Kentucky? Okay. Uh, I think it's here. <laughs> hey, we're walking. We are walking. Okay. Uh, just to point out, uh, because of this uh, has come out, uh, there's been some new fact sheets and bulletins that have been created for these, and, and most of these are, are pretty good, at least of describing what this thing looks like and how to detect it. We still don't really understand uh, a good. Uh, things for, for management of that one. Okay, I'm gonna move in uh, some of the other invasives uh, you need to be aware of, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And here's the deal with the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, Ohio has had at least five or six hemlock woolly adelgid detections over the last decade. Where did they come from? Does anybody know? They were generally on new plantings of hemlocks, generally purchased from places like Pennsylvania and New York, where these were native, they, they had become firmly established and there had come in. Since they were new plantings, plants were under stress. What's gonna happen? These insects are gonna have their way and all of a sudden the, the homeowners were saying, you know the hemlock that you planted last year, they're beginning to uh, they're lose some needles turning a little brown and they got these funny little cotton balls all over them. What's going on? 
Uh, and typically what would happen, landscape managers or garden center people would find them, they would notify us, uh, the, the government folks would de descend on these poor folks and say, we're gonna remove all of your trees. Well, the reality is, uh, here's what it looks like uh, up close if you've not seen this uh, uh, critter. The reality is, is the natural front for this uh, continues to be moving west. Uh, as you, you can see, you've got a pretty good uh, uh, endemic population uh, uh, down here in, in the uh, uh, southeastern part of, of Kentucky. Uh, it has moved over into Ohio and it, we figure wherever this green is uh, will probably be the normal range for this. This is an invasive insect. And as far as I'm concerned, the big deal about this is that there shouldn't really be a big deal in managed landscapes and in the nursery. And the reason for that is that it's very easily controlled, has a fairly complicated life cycle, but basically if we apply a neonicotinoid as a soil drench right when the eggs hatch, we can completely zero this out on an individual tree. Now the beauty of zeroing it out on an individual tree means that the only way that this tree can be infested now is that if new crawlers get blown in from surrounding infested areas. And so again, what I'm recommending for nursery producers, I've, I've been recommending this for Pennsylvania nursery producers for years, one of the first things you want to do if you're growing hemlock for sale is look at the surrounding area. Do you have a woodlot or other areas that have native hemlocks in there? And if possible, what you should probably do is go in and remove those because that's going to soar, uh, serve as the resource for hemlock woolly adelgid crawlers to be moved back into your nursery. And so once you clean that out, once you clean your trees, you should be good to go for quite a while. Same thing in the landscapes. Uh, we, we know that if you treat the landscape plants, we can zero these out. And unless there's a new reinfestation source nearby, uh, you're probably good for at least three, four, maybe even five years before you might get a, a new infestation uh, from that. Where we're really going to have a problem is in the native hemlock forest stands because nobody's out there, nobody wants to spend the money to, to uh, deal with that. And so we're probably gonna lose a lot of those hemlocks. <coughs> Anybody seen any toothpicks sticking out of their trees? How many of you have, have dealt with this in, in your nurseries? Yeah, that, I, I don't mean to force you to raise your hand like this. This isn't a social disease. Uh, this is something that everybody has to deal with and, and so forth. Obviously, there, there's some very important uh, insects that, that uh, or trees that get this. But I want to point out to you that this has gotten a much, much more complicated than we originally thought. We originally thought that we had the granulate ambrosia beetle. And what we're finding now is that there's uh, now nearly a dozen species of imported ambrosia beetles. Where did these things come from? Got any idea? Asia. Uh, obviously Asia, okay. But I mean, I don't see these at the airport, uh, you know, with their little suitcases and whatever coming over. So how did they get over here? Yes, it's crating material. Uh, even though we have an agreement with China, sorry, don't, uh, but it's, that's where it's coming from. Uh, we have an agreement with China that if they use wood crating, that's all supposed to be kill dried. And I've sort of joked, their idea of kill drying is that they cut the tree today, they cut it into lumber tomorrow, they leave it in the sun for a day, and that's kill dried and then they use it as, as crating material. So especially crating material that has bark on it uh, is, is very important uh, for this. And, and we've gotten better at, at reducing this, but the damage has already been done. We've brought a bunch of these things uh, in here. Bottom line with the, the uh, ambrosia beetles uh, is that once you find a heavy infestation, just remove those plants. You're, you're really not going to cure it. Uh, this, this is one of those things that you've got to be on a preventive basis. How can you go with a preventive basis? Well, you've got to know your critter. These are, these are small rascals. But uh, what we are proposing is that you monitor for these. If you happen to be in a zone, if you experienced these ambrosia beetles, it's pretty easy. Uh, the, this is all on the internet. You can find the, the uh, mechanism to do this. And I don't know, uh, Winston, are, are they doing that in some of the IPM sampling over here? Do they have some monitoring traps? 
We do, but mostly with just what we put out. I don't. Okay, but you you can do this yourself, uh, and it's it's very easy. Uh, obviously, a two liter plastic bottle uh, cut in, in some various designs in here. The important thing is is for you to go to the drugstore and see if you can get one of those little snap cap uh, pill vials. Uh, cut a little hole in that and put a, a uh, go to your dentist then get a dental wick uh, and stick this in and, and what you need is the good alcohol. What alcohol is that? Ethyl alcohol. What is ethyl alcohol? Green alcohol. Yeah, it's green alcohol. It's the stuff that we drink, and, and so you can get this at, at the liquor store and, and so forth. Uh, you don't have to do that. You can actually go down to the hardware store and get ethyl alcohol in a can. You probably didn't know this. Shellac thinner, denatured alcohol, is 95% ethyl alcohol. Has a little methanol in there, but we haven't seen the methanol actually chasing off. So as a matter of fact, maybe that methanol may be adding a little extra to this. And so before your plants are actually uh, uh, budding out and, and really showing any signs of growth, you need to set a, a few of these out. Uh, and, and so what we would like you to do is, is once you put these traps out, the trees that you've seen this beetle attacking before, those are the ones that you probably need to put a preventive treatment on. Now, I use a different term for this. When I'm using th something like Dersban uh, or the, the uh, permethrin or bifenthrin in here, and by the way, there needs to be specific formulations of this. The, the permethrin, the formulation that works best is Astro. The formulation of bifenthrin that works best is Onyx or Onyx Pro. What's the difference between those and generics? Uh, it's the spreader sticker that's been added to the formulation to keep this material on the bark. The term that I prefer to use here instead of preventive is prophylactic treatment. Hopefully that sets up a mental image of what we're trying to do. What are we trying to do? We're trying to put a protective condom of insecticide on the bark of the tree so that when the beetle lands on that tree, it's smelling the alcohols and volatiles off of this tree. When they land on there and they have to chew through that bark, if I've got that infused with one of these insecticides, boom, it's dead. It's gonna take off, okay? So that, that's what we need to, to do. Again, uh, even with, uh, with these uh, increased formulations, uh, remember we're typically in a season of the year where we've got fairly frequent rainfall. Probably gonna need to make those applications every two weeks uh, until you're no longer getting the beetles in your trap. And, and that's usually for most of the area that uh, I work in, uh, two and sometimes three applications to get you through that window. Any questions on those? Okay. What are those brand names again? Pardon? Uh, Astro is the permethrin, and Oli Onyx is the bifenthrin. Moving into some of the other critters, uh, uh, moving into the, the leaf miners that I talked about, uh, I find it interesting. I've found less and less and less birch leaf miner uh, out there. But I'm seeing more and more and more of other types of leaf miners. Now, uh, in those sawfly leaf miners, and I apologize for, for not having the images uh, for these, the other sawfly leaf miner that we're seeing real significant increases in populations are the hawthorn leaf miners. Uh, those, again, remember, are sawfly leaf miners, and it's important to remember that they're sawfly leaf miners. How many of you are growing the new hybrid elms? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, my feeling is, is the people that develop the new hybrid elms, great and wonderful, they're very disease re resistant and, and uh, uh, counteract that, but they didn't look for the bugs on these, and, and they're really bug food. Uh, and and uh, one of the, the critters that they get in there is the elm leaf liner, which is another sawfly. Uh, and what's the beauty of those is that the birch leaf miner, the hawthorn leaf miner, and the elfin leaf miner, all being sawflies, are very easily taken care of, again, with those neonicotinoids. <clears throat> the boxwood leaf miner, on the other hand, now you saw a picture that looked just like that from Julie. What does that look like? Yeah, it looks like the, the boxwood blight in, in there. And, and, uh, 
Uh, so how are you going to tell the difference between these? Well, in this particular case, you can tell the difference between these because if you look at the backs of the leaves, what you'll find if, right, right now is those blisters. If you look at these in the springtime when this normally really begins to appear, if you take a look at the leaves and peel back the undersurface of the epidermis, you'll find both the larvae and the pupae of the boxwood leaf liner in there. And here, but here's my problem is, I find both the disease and the leaf miners in the same plant. So in many cases, you may still want to send that sample to your diagnostic clinic just to make sure that you're not dealing with two of those. <clears throat> Here's another one that we're seeing a real hit to those hybrid elms. It's almost making these hybrid elms uh, kind of not good plants in the landscape. Uh, again, it's cosmetic. They're not going to kill the plants, but they're going to turn these uh, hybrid elms brown uh, by the middle of the summer. And this is the elm flea weevil. Uh, it's actually a little beetle. It's a true weevil. And what it does is it makes this window painting uh, on the leaves. Uh, the, it almost looks like a leaf beetle. Uh, can look to inexperienced eye to maybe be Japanese beetle feeding on those. Now, what I'm also noticing is you'll notice that the brown tip of the leaf, that's actually where the larvae of these mine the leaves. So the larvae are leaf miners, but then the adults are also the skeletonizers. And, and so we can get uh, the, the, both the, the larval damage as well as the adult damage on these. Uh, again, fairly easy to knock down as the adults. My strategy on these is that the leaf mines are really fairly minor. They, they uh, are done very early in the season. The plant as it grows will cover that up. What you need to be thinking about is knocking down the adult weevils. And my, again, my feeling is if you've got a block of elms in a particular area that's having this and you don't have surrounding elms in the forested areas, a treatment as simple as using one of the cheapest pyrethroids will knock this down very quickly, uh, take it out and, and uh, uh, not have it uh, hopefully as badly the next season. Okay, when it comes to the leaf miner insecticides, uh, we've got a, and remember, nurseries are different than landscapes. There's a lot of insecticides. One of my favorite old-fashioned insecticides, dimethoate, used to be Saigon that was available in the landscape, but you can no longer use that. It's been, been removed from the landscape usage, still available for you in the nurseries. And here's what I find is interesting. When I talk to nursery producers, what is their hesitation of using dimethoate? The smell. Ah, yes, it's, a, it's, an, it's an organophosphate, pretty stinky. I'm surprised you didn't say the toxicity level of this. It, it, for some reason, dimethoate has gotten this real bad rep of toxicity. Well, the LD50 of this is about 250. Okay, that's medium toxicity. What else is that, that LD50? Remember that bifenthrin that I mentioned to you, the pyrethroid? It's about that level. Seven or carbaryl, about that level. Dursban or chlorpyrifos, about that level. So I don't know where this really got this bad rap as being this really dangerous insecticide, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it is a medium toxicity. The reason why it was removed from urban landscape usage is that EPA had a policy they wanted to get rid of all the organophosphates in the urban environment, and, and they've accomplished that. We're suffering from bed bugs from that, but at least uh, they, they, they accomplished the, that particular task. So you still have that available. You still have asaphate or orthene uh, as available. Now, this is one that can be used by a registered person in landscapes. You can uh, purchase this and use it in specific formulations. <coughs> In the adulticides, virtually all the pyrethroids work, but what's unique about the pyrethroids? These are systemic, this is systemic, these are only by contact or surface feeding. And so these have to be used as preventives, and my feeling is trying to get out there the day or two before a leaf miner adult is ready to lay its eggs is an almost impossible task. And, and so while we've got them, they're registered for that, probably not a, an easy way to go. How about some of the newer materials, what I call the alternate materials? Uh, a lot of people are worried about the neonicotinoids, but let me point out to you, all neonicotinoids are not the same. I, I find it interesting. People say, well, the neonicotinoids are all the same. Well, that's, that's like saying all the organophosphates 
are all the same, and all the carbamates are all the same. They all have different attributes and different things. Let me point some of these out. Imidacloprid or Merit, uh, thiamethoxam or flagship, and arena or loft, which t contain clothianidin, are highly toxic to pollinators, especially bees, okay? So I'm not gonna mince any words about it. I would not use those on plants prior to the time that those plants are going to be flowering. After they flowered, fine. But before they flower, or just before they flower, I would watch out. On the other hand, what we find is, is that uh, Dinotefuron in Safari and Acetamiprid, which is in Tristar, and especially Tristar has got a very low toxicity rating on honeybees. Still systemic, but very low rating for those. So uh, if you wanna be bee conscious in that, and let's say if you've got to use something that, that might be in a flowering phase, I would uh, seriously consider using something like Tristar uh, or Acetamiprid. A little bit more expensive. Now here's the other issues that we have with these. Merit, Flagship, Clothianidin, and Safari are excellent on beetles. They're excellent on sawflies, but they are very poor on caterpillars. Tristar, on the other hand, is an excellent caterpillar control material. As a matter of fact, if you look at the label of Tristar, the first whole block of listing is a whole bunch of caterpillars that are in there. So if you're looking for a caterpillar active neonicotinoid, that's the one that we need to be thinking about. Now, why is that going to be important to us? What other caterpillars that we have that are major pests in your trees, other than foliar caterpillars? Remember the clearwing bores? Okay, dogwood boar, rhododendron boar, uh, peach tree boar, lesser peach tree boar, and, and so forth. We're having trouble with those, especially in grafted stock, and what we're finding is that TriStar is an excellent product to be thinking about that. On the other hand, if you've got dimethoate, that's also an excellent product uh, for those. Now, people are saying, well, what about some alternatives other than neonics? Uh, I'm here to, to, again, recommend azadiractin. Uh, and here's the problem. When you purchase azadiractins, there are gonna be two things that are on the market. One of them is neem oil extract, worthless. Not gonna do a damn thing for you, okay? Pardon my French. Uh, what you need to do is get a product that says on the label, may say uh, neem seed extract and all the rest of it, but what you wanna see on the active ingredients, you want it to state in the active ingredients that it has a, per, a certain percentage of azadiractins. What is that telling you? Well, here's the, the problem with this one. Uh, neem is extracted from the seeds of the neem tree, and what this, this seed has is a lot of oils in it, and so you can actually use those oily extracts as a horticultural oil or a dormant oil kind of a material. How do the oils kill? Okay, only by contact. You've got to hit the critter uh, and, and kill them by that. And, and so there's no residual action for that. There's no activity from that. What we also find is that the neem tree also produces a suite of chemicals. There's about four isomers of this that are called collectively the azadiractins. These are anti-feeding. In other words, when an insect picks them, I go, oh, this tastes bad, I'm gonna go somewhere else. If the insect insists on feeding on it, what it does is it has what we call a growth regulator effect. So if it's a small insect, it won't molt correctly and it'll die that way. If it's an adult insect, it will sterilize them. Kind of neat, okay? Uh, but you've gotta have the azadiractin in there. The oily component is irrelevant. It has to have the azadiractin. So when you're buying those kinds of products, you need to be thinking uh, that, that listed on the label, it should say, contains X amount of azadiractins in there. <clears throat> Another one that, that's also hitting uh, mainly the greenhouse market, uh, but we're beginning to see this more in, in nursery uh, production and so forth, are conserves. Uh, the, these are materials that contain spinosins. Uh, and, and there are some new formulations coming on. We've just found out recently that Dow, which is the one that, that had this, has actually started to make a synthetic 
spinosum, uh, and obviously has more activity and, and so forth. This is a, uh, a bio-based, both of these are bio-based. Neem is, is a plant extract. This conserve is a microbial byproduct. In other words, they ferment up uh, 100,000 gallon tanks of, of this uh, soil-dwelling uh, microbe, uh, and then they skim off the top of that, refine it, and they come out with these spinosids which in this particular case are very good for fly control and for moth control. Now what's missing in there? Beetles. Not very good on, on beetles in this particular case. Another interesting thing about the, the uh, spinosids or conserve is that they're pretty good on mites. And so they, they, we'll talk about this when we get to the miticides. <coughs> Winston, how much time do we got? Your Pretty close. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's talk about some of the, the what I call the ever-present things in here. I, I definitely want to get into the, the scales and the spider mites, uh, and uh, you might just have to invite me back again to, to get the rest of these uh, done in here. When it comes to the scales, remember that uh, uh, life is fairly simple, if you just keep this in mind, that in the scale world, generally we have what we call soft scales and armored scales. The big difference between those is that the soft scales always have their nymphs and even the adults uncovered. What does that mean? That means that soaps and oils are your friend in this particular case. Uh, and, and horticultural oils, even in the summertime on most plants, are not a, a, a real issue in phytotoxicity. And wh where is that coming from? The chemical companies that produce these horticultural oils have learned to take the sulfur out of the oils and also to reduce the, the molecular weight of them. So they hit, they do their activity, they evaporate off of the plant very quickly and you don't get the chance of penetrating into the plant tissues to cause phytotoxicity. So I'm a real proponent of uh, putting horticultural oils out, a 3% oil uh, at almost any time that, that you want to go after some of these critters is a very good uh, way to go. When it comes to the soft scales, very easy to do, except once the females begin to swell up and produce eggs, don't even try it. You're, you're not going to get it. Why? Because not only do you have this dead exoskeleton of the, of the female, she's got, uh, in many of these uh, scales, like this calico scale, she can lay between 500 and 1,000 eggs underneath that shell. And there's just no way you're going to get oil to penetrate all in through there to contact all of those eggs. What you need to do is to say, oops, I'm going to mark this. I'm going to come back uh, a month later when those crawlers are out on the leaves and then use my oil and take the crawlers out on the leaves. <laughs> Other ones that we see, uh, we're seeing a, a fair amount of, or in the Ohio increase of the Fletcher scale. This is another soft scale that seems to uh, get primarily on things like, like junipers, uh, arborvitae, and uh, uh, taxis or ewes and so forth. Uh, we're seeing this uh, fairly common out there. Again, uh, a couple of oil treatments uh, usually will work on this one. We also see magnolia scale. Now, what's the difference between magnolia scale and most of the other soft scales? Magnolia scale only emerges in August and early September to release its crawlers. Virtually all the other soft scales have their crawlers emerging in late May through mid-June. Okay? So you have to kind of readjust. If you're going after magnolia scale, the time you want to hit those plants with the oils would be mid to late September after those crawlers have come down. Uh, for most of those other soft scales, they might be in, in phases that aren't feeding and might not be as easily controlled. Armored scales, uh, obviously we have pine needle scale, uh, oyster shell scale. We're seeing a real resurgence of oyster shell scale. Heard a lot of, of uh, talk here about the, the uh, uh, Japanese maple scale. Uh, and I know it's, it's real, it's, it's here, uh, but here's my take on the scales. Virtually all of these scales are very easily controlled at the crawler phase. You can use oils, you can use soaps, but again, I'm, I'm not a real proponent of those. What I think you should be doing is number one, monitoring these armored scales especially. Two years before you're ready to harvest a plant, 
You know, if the scales are there, make a note of it, not going to be important, but if they start really covering the plant, uh, then you might take after them. But two years before harvest, what you want to do is undergo a cleaning program to clean those plants. You want, your goal is to try to get these scales down to near zero. How can you accomplish that? You're going to have to use some of those neonicotinoids that I talked about. And the two best neonicotinoids are clothianidin, which is uh, in the Arena uh, product, or you're going to need to use Safari Dinotefuron. Those are the two best. The beauty of these is that if you know and again, you can find all of this information out in most of the booklets. Some of the IPM programs have scouts that are going out and, and watching for the crawlers emerging. You can get that information. My recommendation, if you can get this done in your nursery, two to three weeks after the first crawler emergence, that's when you want to apply these systemic insecticides. And what they will do is they will be picked up into the vascular system of the plant. They will take out the settled crawlers and the settled nymphs and pretty well zero you out. Okay? So again, two years before you're ready to harvest, that's when you really want to uh, go and, and zero these things out. And the reason why I want them zeroed out is that when they get planted into the landscape, the first thing that I see is these armored scales have their way with those stressed plants. And so that's why we want to try to zero them out. When you're growing them, you're growing them fast, uh, they're, they're, they're healthy and, and all the rest of that, but all hell breaks out if you haven't really sort of zeroed these things out by the time you sell them to the customer and they get into the landscape. On the soft scales, do the ants self protect them? Yes, the ants do protect them. Uh, Dan Potter here at Kentucky had a couple of graduate students that, that have uh, shown some very good data where actually they, they put ant control material at the base of the trees and all of a sudden the soft scales disappeared. Yeah. And the reason why the soft scales disappear is that they have a whole suite of little parasitic wasps and they've also got things like lady beetle larvae that, that will eat them, but the ants will protect them. They'll chase off the little wasp and they'll nip the lady beetles until they drop off. So uh, there's some neat pictures of that on, on YouTube. <clears throat> when it comes again to the scales, you again have some, some other materials and if you don't want to use one of these neonicotinoids, remember you still have dimethoate. Dimethoate has been a very powerful scale control material, but again the time that you want to apply that dimethoate is the time that the crawlers have emerged and recently settled on the plant. And here, I, again, I, I hate to take too much time on this. <clears throat> what we have found for many of the armored scales, once they settle, first instar crawler, they suck juice, they shed their exoskeleton, now they are the second instar nymph, they have to suck juice, they pretty well mature, they shed their exoskeleton again. If they're a bisexual species, meaning males and females, the males come out, mate with the females, and what happens is that once the female has been mated, she often stops feeding. And she may stop that feeding for a month, two months, almost for the rest of the season. So what's the, the issue with that? Well, if you're using a systemic insecticide and she's not feeding, nothing's going to happen. So that's why we've changed this idea. Even if you're using a systemic, you want to be in the plant system when that settled crawler, second instar nymph, and the early adults are still feeding in order to take them out. <clears throat> spider mites, the only spider mite you need to be concerned about is two-spotted spider mite. What do two-spotted spider mites eat in your nurseries? Now, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the, the bedding plants and perennials and things like that. Your woody tree stock, what do they get into? Have you seen spider mites on maple? That's the maple spider mite. Have you seen spider mites on uh, honey locust? That's a honey locust spider mite. Have you seen any spider mites on viburnum? That's two spotted spider mite. Have you seen spider mites on winged geonimus? 
that's two-spotted spider mite. And the reason why I want to point out the difference of those, it's only two-spotted spider mite is the issue. And the issue is two-spotted spider mite is a common greenhouse and perennial plant production pest, which means that it's been subjected to virtually every miticide known. And you often are dealing with resistant populations. But when you're dealing with any of these other mites, spruce spider mite, oak spider mite, we're gonna see some great oak spider mite uh, activity today, uh, and, and all the rest of these, any miticide that you use, as a matter of fact, my recommendation is again horticultural oils. 2% oil as long as you can get really good coverage on the foliage of the plant. We'll take most of these other mites out and here's the other deal. Even if it's two spotted spider mite, two spotted spider mite has never developed resistant to oil. Bingo. Okay, so I'm a, I'm a, 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 when it comes to the miticides, I'm kind of an oil fanatic. The other thing you have to remember, are you treating damage or are you treating mites? And this is where I really strongly support the I, IPM approach is sample first. Make sure that the mites are active because we're gonna see damage out in the oak trees today, uh, but I saw very few oak spider mites still active. They're, they were probably active last month. They pretty well have shut down for the summer, but their damage is still there. So if you go out and treat that, you're wasting your time and money because you're not going to be controlling them. Same thing with the spruce spider mite. I noticed this little dwarf Alberta, it's not very dwarf, but the Alberta spruce out in, in the front of the building. Did anybody notice on the inside of that plant? When you go out, take a look at that. There's a lot of browning on the inside of that. That's partially spruce spider mite, but it's also spruce areophyid mite or spruce rust mite uh, that, that's causing that damage. The difference between this one is that that areophyid mite and the spruce spider mite are what we call cool season mites. This is the mite population, September, October, November. Look at that population. Right now, nothing there. The damage is there. You can see the damage, but there's no active mites. So in this particular case, if you're going after spruce spider mites, go after them in the fall. It's been our experience, if you can pretty well zero them out here, they won't appear the following spring. But if you didn't get to them in, uh, in the fall, you can get them in, in May, early June, before they shut down for the summer uh, and, and are inactive again. Okay. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.